Thank you so much for coming. It's really great to have all of us here. I think of uh, William the Conqueror, who was it? Who said, we few, we happy few. So it's really amazing to have all of us here. And um, I think just we are what is going to magnetize this event. And so, you know, if we, if we want this to happen, we all have to show up. And it's really lovely to have all of you. Um, so I just wanted to reflect on last week, last Friday, just a week ago, uh, and Mejia said something to me, and I hope I'm not robbing her of her talk materials, but <clears throat> she said that it was so fascinating to have all four speakers embody like a different energy and a different quality. And she was saying that I agree with um, how Ruby was joy, exuded joy, and Benedetta was sincerity, and I was enthusiasm, and um, Arudra here was depth. And so just how beautiful it is that, you know, we're talking about the same subject. We all, in a way, have a very similar shared experience, and yet our expressions of the divine can be so unique and individually uplifting. And Mahi and I spoke afterward, and we both just reflected on that even this whole past week, we have felt a certain upliftment and for me, I really, I had felt that, and I didn't even necessarily know what it is, and I was kind of thinking it was all these other factors, diet, or going to bed earlier this night, or whatever it was, but yeah, reflecting that it really was this energy that carried along with me of this uplifting um, energy flow. So I was trying to gather some inspiration for our lovely speakers today, and so I actually um, took Journey to Self-Realization and was trying to flip through some of the uh, opening title titles to see if there was anywhere where Yogananda spoke about giving speeches. And I uh, basically couldn't find anything on that vein, um, but I did find uh, in the very beginning, sort of the preface, Dayamata wrote a little letter about how Yogananda would give these talks. And I just wanted to read from it just for a paragraph. Also, as a heads up, I'm going to speak in English, but we also have today um, Gopala, who's going to be speaking in Italian, and then Jayadari Mahia, who will be speaking in English. And that's kind of our hope, is to um, do half English and half Italian. And then if we have enough time, we would work on the translation. So. But here's just what Diamata wrote. The master seldom made even the slightest preparation for his lectures. If he prepared anything at all, it might consist of a factual note or two hastily jotted down. Very often, while riding in the car on the way to the temple, he would casually ask one of us, what is my subject today? He would put his mind on it and then give the lecture extemporaneously from an inner reservoir of divine inspiration. So, I don't know how you guys have prepared for your talks. <laughs> have to be like that, but just, <laughs> you know, even in his lectures, he would go rushing onto the stage and be, how feels everyone, awake and ready, and have so much energy and enthusiasm and divine love and all those qualities, he probably embodied all those qualities that we also um, embodied during our speeches, um, and it also, she talks about how Yogananda in the middle, mid-speech, would just like immediately be communing with the divine and be speaking from a place of complete the divine truth just flowing through him. And at other times he would have visions of Christ or divine mother or Saint Francis even, and he would just go into directly speaking to them as if he were, I mean, when he was seeing them and the whole audience and crowd would feel that. And so I think if I could leave you with any inspiration, it would be just not even the words, not even how amazing the talk goes and if you get all the points you wanted and if your little bicycle gets to the end of the road that you thought you were gonna get to. It's more about just sharing our consciousness and that that's the biggest blessing you can give to other people. And um, so I, I know that will happen and each of you just by your daily practice and commitment to your spiritual path and meditation, I know that this time, however few or many of us there are, it's going to be really beautiful. And also welcome to any other audience on the web. Um, happy birthday to Kalamali, who was yesterday. Bikram's the husband of Kalamali, who's in America. 
Um, but with that, I would love to present our first speaker. Again, we have three speakers. Mejia will be going last. Gopala will be speaking in Italian and going second. And Jayadara, I'd like to welcome you up, who will be speaking first. So thank you. Let's give a round of applause. So, what's my subject? <laughs> um, I wanted to start off on telling a story that I heard probably seven years ago that was really inspiring. They, um, Diana, she was speaking at SRW and she got up in front of the crowd. I was almost to, in tears after this. Uh, after this, it was uh, the story of the um, um, in the Mahabharata where um, Dronacharya he got all all the Pandavas and he put them up in a line in front of um, the sky and he had them take an arrow each one of them and point into the sky and um, he went to each one each uh, each. Um, each student, he'd tell them, what do you see? And one, one of them would say, well, I see the sky. Oops, okay, okay, put the arrows down. He would go to the next one, well, I, I, um, I see a bird flying in the air. He says, okay, um, go aside. He'd finally get to Arjuna, and when he got to Arjuna, he says, Arjuna, what do you see? He says, I see the eye of the eagle. He says, shoot! And to me, it was so, I mean, hearing, <laughs> to be honest, I was like, oh my God. But to me, that just really encapsulates everything. It's, we know our spiritual path. We know where we're going. We have to be focused. We have to um, go towards our goal. In the last several days, I've been reflecting on the words, um, open your heart to me and I will enter and take charge of your life. And to me, really, this embodies our entire spiritual path that it doesn't really matter um, how much we meditate. I mean, sometimes I'll sit down and meditate and um, I'll be like, okay, I'm starting at six, I'm ending at six, um, 7.45, you know, um, 7.35 I'll come around, I'm starting looking at the clock, when do I get up? And to me, um, God isn't keeping a scorecard in the heavens. He's not looking in, um, saying, okay, Jaidar has meditated this amount of time, he's done this amount of service. He's looking at your heart and seeing where your heart is at. When, when we pass from this world, there is a story of an angel. There was a man who went up into the heavens and he was a very successful businessman. And um, he did everything on the worldly sense what um, an ideal life would be. And then when he got to the heavens, the angel asked him, how much have you loved? And he says, well, you know, and I did these things, and he says, how much have you loved? And finally they found a, a little point in his life where he, he did love just a little bit. It was his dog or something. And, um, and they let him into the gates of heaven. But to me, I try to visualize in my day-to-day -day life, how much am I loving? And um, if we keep that our focus, it doesn't matter how much we meditate. It doesn't matter how much we serve, it's how much we love in each and every moment to each and every individual that comes into our lives. And when we do that, then um, God smiles at us. Um, there was a story I wanted to tell one time I was with Swami, when I was with Swami. Um, uh, this was before I was on his personal staff. Um, it was a time in Ananda, India, where there was only like seven people living inside the community, and every single night there would be a movie night. I think he just wanted to spend time with the people inside the community. So we'd go and um, watch this movie with him, and at one evening, um, everybody was putting stuff away, and somehow, miraculously, I was there alone in the room with Swami. There was Swami looking at me, and um, we just started chatting. And I said, Swami, um, you know, the, my greatest incentive, where I, why I want to help people, because I know what it is to suffer. Um, I know what pain the majority of people, I mean, it's easy to see happy people all the time at Ananda, but when, um, when you're out in the world, there's a lot of suffering there. Even if they're happy, they're joyful, on the inside, they, they're, when you don't have God, you're suffering. That's the truth of it. And uh, even if they know it or not. And I, I know what it's like to be without God in my heart, or consciously. 
And I told him this, and Swami says, that's very good. But remember, it's not you who's helping people. Um, we do this as a community. We do this as an energy, a ray of light shining on this world. I mean, um, that's not exactly what I said, but that's what he meant. And, um, and together, what inspires me most about this path is that I'm here with my guru bhais. I'm here with um, a spiritual family. They say that the biggest blessing in the three worlds is to having a guru. And I think the biggest, the second blessing is having a spiritual family because it's easy to get lost in that in the world. And it's easy to get hung up on this thing and hung up on that thing. But when you can be a part of a ray of light that you could just feel shining through you, it's, it's more than um, yourself. It's more than this um, place. It's um, a feeling that you get in your heart of master um, saying, it's okay, I'm with you. Um, now here's this devotee, shine a little light on him. Or go and do the service and shine a little light on that. Um, because that's how God speaks in this world. And that's how, um, I mean, that's where his instruments. Um, God's not going to shine from the heavens and, and uh, bestow this blessing, bestow that blessing. You're God's channel. And um, by his channel, then you, in turn, I mean, you will be blessed, but you will also bless another person. So to me, that's the most wonderful thing about this path. Thank you, everyone. Leggo tutto. Buongiorno, siete, è un piacere per me essere qui davanti a voi. Siete un ottimo pubblico. Non avete neanche i pomodori e le uova da tirarmi, quindi... <ride> Cosa mi piace a me di questo sentiero? Beh, ehm... Allora, beh, che cosa mi ha portato qui prima? Um, ok, funziona. Il desiderio della verità. Allora, io, um, come sapete, gli italiani sono attaccati alla mamma e non è stato facile staccarsi e venire a vivere qua. Uh, nel senso che ero, come dire... Nel senso che allora io quando ehm, avevo una buona vita, diciamo, nel senso che allora facevo un lavoro di rappresentante, eh, avevo buoni amici, famiglia, e, a un certo punto però sembrava che non bastasse mai. Mi ricordo c'è un, un canto di Giovanotti, non so chi di voi lo conosce, che si intitola, eh, vabbè, che diceva voglio di più e non mi basta mai, no? Abbiamo qualcosa dentro di noi, ognuno, che vuole sempre qualcosa di più e lo cerchiamo sempre fuori. E penso che ognuno di noi che è qua è perché bene o male ha cercato fuori tante volte e non ha trovato magari perfettamente quello che voleva. E a un certo punto penso che ti rivolgi dentro e non è tanto importante, eh, appunto come diceva anche Jaidara prima, come facciamo, cioè ore di cria, ok, è proprio importante più che altro tirare fuori il nostro, quello che siamo, no? ad esempio eh, per me era che ero nella stanza e stavo ascoltando una, un canto di Enya e, e avevo chiesto quel giorno lì, dicevo ma come io sono, sono qui, non è possibile che la vita sia solo questa, ci deve essere qualcosa di più e, e e praticamente ho sentito, ho detto, ma se c'è qualcuno mi deve rispondere. Io non sono, e poi ho detto, ma non sono stato programmato per fare questa domanda. Non è che sono, eh, sono cosciente. Quindi se c'è qualcuno lì mi deve rispondere. E, e un giorno o due dopo ho trovato l'eterna ricerca dell'uomo. Ed è un libro che, 
è molto bello, cioè appunto di Yoga Nando lo conoscete tutti che mi ha portato qua. Ehm, cosa... Ah, volevo raccontare anche una, una cosa, ecco, di una storia del... Stavo facendo un corso di Raja Yoga sulla devozione, appunto, una storia che mi ha toccato perché personalmente, perché eh, dentro di me penso di essere capace di fare qualsiasi cosa se mi impegno, no? E allora facevo, meditavo abbastanza e convinto di essere forte, un, un buon devoto spirituale, così. E c'era questo, interessante perché c'era questo corso di Raja Yoga con, con Shivani e altri Kriyaban, e c'è questo esperimento, non so, alcuni di voi lo conoscono, molti di voi lo conoscono, alcuni magari no, con le bacchette per misurare l'aura, no? E di una persona. E... Prima hanno provato altre persone, hanno fatto vedere come loro erano normali e, queste bacche... e c'era una certa aura. Poi facevano certe pratiche e l'aura era molto più grande, tipo 10-15 metri. Ho detto, wow, mamma mia, adesso... E poi ho detto... Poi verso dopo un po', ne hanno provati due prima di me, dopo un po', ma devi fare... Uh, chi, è che si sent- chi è che si sente un buon Kriya Ban che può fare dei buoni Kriya qua e là uh, adesso proviamo qualcosa di più difficile io, eh, faccio io dai. <ride> allora sono andato lì <ride> e, è stato bello perché appunto uh, viene con le bacchette e mi misura l'aura boh, un metro, un metro e mezzo non lo so e, e poi ha detto uh, allora, adesso poi gli altri provavano a mandare pensieri negativi e ha riprovato e, e ha detto di fare Hong So. E io ho detto, va bene, dai, faccio Hong So, faccio il mio meglio. Ho fatto Hong So e Laura era praticamente a zero, non c'era niente, le bacchette si aprivano qua. <ride> ho detto, porca miseria, qua devo provare, non funziona, devo, devo provare qualcosa di più. E dopo ho provato a fare Cria. E mi ha detto, prof, ma io mi fa prova a fare cria eh, perché è più forte. Ho provato a fare cria, zero. Allora ero proprio in panico, ho detto, cosa faccio? E ma mi fa, no, si vede che è proprio zero, non vale, non vale niente, qua e là, tutto fatica sprecata quello che facciamo. Ma io mi ha detto, prova a pensare a Dio, prova a pensare a quanto ti sei amato, quanto, una volta che ti sei sentito più amato nella tua vita. Ho fatto solo quel pensiero di un'esperienza che adesso magari vi racconto e, e, lo, e praticamente l'aura era molto molto grande e abbracciava tutti e, e, loro no, e a loro anche dice che non si riuscivano a sentire, si sentivano molto bene. È stato, e io avevo pensato una volta che ero qua, una delle prime volte che sono venuto ad Ananda, che mi ricordo c'era un bel corso, era un'estate, e ero andato qua fuori, era un periodo, prima volta quando viene da Nanda si sente un po' scosso, interno e esterno, non dorme, tante cose strane, come penso che sentite che succedono le cose qua. E, e mi ero sentito, ero andato fuori avevo un, e mi avevo sentito come quasi una scintilla di immortalità. E di fatti poi ero andato fuori tutto esaltato, tutto contento qua, avevo trovato un signore che condividevamo la stanza e gli avevo detto, ma adesso come devo fare a vivere? <ride> e, era un po'... Ehm, a me cosa, cosa... Ah, ecco, una cosa che volevo anche condividere era che, che è molto bello quello che sta succedendo adesso tra noi giovani e che sento anche... Eh, che tanti di noi potrebbero essere davanti e dare anche ad altri giovani che sono fuori. E, e la forza dell'unione, proprio insieme secondo me possiamo fare tanto perché eh, mi piace questa storia. Ad esempio fuori ci sono i criminali, si uniscono, eh, cercano di capire come fare una cosa o un'altra, svaleggiare una banca, che ne so. E unirsi, eh, questa forza in positivo anche noi possiamo veramente unirci e provare ognuno a, a dei talenti dentro che possiamo veramente fare tanto e di fatti eh, è secondo me dall'unione che parte perché un giorno avevo chiesto a Shivani e ho detto ma Shivani ma quando è che posso provare a iniziare a insegnare? <ride> e, quando è che posso? e lei mi ha detto e praticamente non mi aveva risposto eh, ascoltato un po' avevo chiesto qualcos'altro e lei mi, mi ha detto 
praticamente il messaggio era inserisciti in comunità. Solo quello mi ha detto. Ho detto vabbè. Allora questo punto è secondo me anche un po' eh, quello che sto provando di fare. Anche adesso per dire sto facendo Ananda Yoga Teacher Training e dopo cinque anni che sono qua e devo dire che è una meraviglia e se posso consigliarlo anche a, a, a voi. E, e un'altra volta... Eh, Vorrei raccontare anche una storia di Swami, con Swami, che ero la, la scorsa estate, ero da Nanda Village, e, ero da Nanda Village e c'era la Spiritual Renewal Week, che un, per chi di voi non lo conosce è un programma molto bello, che è durante l'agosto, e, e tutti quelli della comunità intervengono e parlano della loro storia, del loro rapporto con Swami, con Yogananda e c'era il sabato questo, questo discorso con, Swami, con Swamiji e, e il venerdì si poteva mettere delle, un, fare una domanda no? chi ha una domanda può farla allora era un'occasione, c'erano due cestini, tanta gente metteva il bigliettino qua e là ho detto vabbè proviamo anche, provo anch'io anche perché mi sentivo già così benedetto anche solo di essere poter seguire Swami un pochettino fisicamente e anche in pubblico di solito non gli avevo chiesto domande, lo lasciavo agli altri. E ho detto, vabbè, mettiamo il biglietto. Sembra, per me sembrava un po' una lotteria, tanto tutti che mettono il biglietto, lo mettiamo. E ho, fatto, ho messo il mio biglietto, il giorno dopo c'è stato questo question and answer con Swamiji, che è stato molto è stato bellissimo, perché era anche, vi consiglio di vedere se volete su, eh, sul sito. E, e Swami era l'ultimo discorso che poi ha fatto in pubblico ad Ananda Village, perché poi non, non è più tornato in forma fisica, no, lì. E, e alla fine, era stato molto bello, ha, ha chiuso il, il question and answer, ha, ha mandato, ha voluto, si è alzato in piedi, il pubblico gli voleva mandare tre home, gli hanno mandato tutti degli om. e... E Swamiji ha anche voluto rispondere con altri tre uomini, anche lui, al pubblico. E poi eh, ha guardato ancora il foglio, aveva un foglio che non ci sono, so, ci sono state tantissime domande, ha detto, ehm, però c'è ancora una domanda che vorrei rispondere, e se vi potete sedere tutti, <ride> c'erano 300 persone, non so quante che erano, e tutti si sono riseduti. E, e Swamiji ha ha risposto, ha detto la domanda che, che avevo chiesto e la risposta è e in quel momento proprio mi sono sentito come eh, proprio pervaso, non so, proprio da, da lui, dalla... non era neanche Swamiji, era qualcosa dietro di lui che arrivava e veniva verso di me e... È incredibile perché non, io non mi aspettavo neanche più che potesse rispondere alla mia domanda e non so neanche se mi ricordo veramente parole. Qualcosa sì, ma è più che altro una vibrazione potente un, un, che penso che ognuno eh, può sentire perché siamo tutti collegati, quindi eh, chiunque può sentire. Mi ricordo anche da piccolo avevo fatto... Uh, io avevo un, un fratello che ha tre anni in più e quando litigavamo io ero più piccolo, lui era più forte fisicamente quindi mi pestava <ride> se litigavamo ogni tanto poco, meno male e quando abbiamo litigato io una volta l'ho morso uh, usavo i denti perché ero più debole e, e poi mi ricordo quella volta lì sono rimasto molto anche se avevo fatto male a lui poi dopo, mamma mia, mi ero sentito piccolo, ma proprio piccolo, e, e avevo pianto, e ho detto, ma come, ma come sarebbe questa storia? Mi sentivo proprio ferito dentro, chiuso, e ma come sarebbe? Ho fatto male a lui e sento, e sento male io? Com'è com questa storia? Cioè, sono, è così, anche questo per dire che siamo tutti collegati, ma un'altra cosa, ritornando alla storia di Swamiji, è che... Eh, 
invito, visto che siamo, magari qualcuno dell'America vede, che questo discorso è online e che appunto come l'uomo tante volte non ci arriva, no? Io sono son convinto che quella risposta me l'avrà risposta proprio, era proprio Dio, per me... Eh, come ognuno può avere delle esperienze col divino eh, perché ad esempio l'uomo cioè le altre persone quando hanno messo questo video su internet eh, alla fine l'hanno tagliato e non hanno, messo, non hanno messo questa domanda che era eh, in più quindi praticamente il video gli manca questa, questa parte no? che faceva parte anche della domanda e risposta e, Bene, vi ringrazio tutti. Eh. Oh, non so cosa. <ride> Grazie a voi. Now we have to switch our minds back into English. It's hard sometimes when you hear people speaking in Italian and then you start thinking in Italian and then you have to switch back. It sound, it's sometimes feels strange speaking in English. So I want to underline what Rachel said. I, I really, really appreciate each one of you and Jaidara and Gopala today and everybody last week. I'm just, I'm really, really, touched and appreciative, I think is the word, by each one's special quality and um, yeah, the special quality that each one of us brings to the spiritual path uh, in the way that we share. But that's not my talk, so. When I was thinking about, um, I asked myself the question, so what is so special to me about the spiritual path? What do I appreciate about it? Um, The answer came immediately, the fact that I'm on it. And then I thought, well, that's a strange answer because let me try and understand that. So I asked myself, so what does it mean, the fact that I'm uh, on the spiritual path? Because everybody's, Swami says, as you know, everybody's on the spiritual path. He had that dream in which he saw that everybody was essentially looking for the same thing, which is bliss, happiness. So we're all moving towards that goal of union with God whether we're conscious of it or not. So I realized that the point that I wanted to make to myself was that I was so grateful that I am consciously on the spiritual path. And there was an experience I had um, it was a few weeks ago. Well, maybe it was a bit more than that now. Arudra and I were in the Lake District in England. And all of this, this experience that happened got me thinking about... Um, what life would have been like if I wasn't on the spiritual path consciously. Because just before we went to England, somebody gave me um, a couple of DVDs that were about um, how we can be more resourceful with the environment, how can we, we can have less impact on the earth. And this is something which really, um, is really strong in me. It really resonates with me. And so, that's my phone, sorry. <laughs> that's funny. And um, <laughs> God's God. <laughs> and so I was already in this kind of consciousness thinking about all of these environmental issues. And then when I went back to England, it's almost like the energy there around the, these issues is even stronger. There's a lot of awareness about it, a lot of things happening. And we were staying in a cottage, so we were buying all of our own shopping, and it's something that doesn't usually happen to us, being part of the ashram system. We don't do our own shopping so much. <laughs> and um, so we were really creating all of... We, there was all this packaging from all of the food that we were buying, you know, and I was really you know, I am not going to waste anything, I will not throw anything away in the rubbish, and 
I had, you know, on the counter of the kitchen, I had where the paper was going to be recycled, and there was the plastic, and then there was the Tetra Pak, and even the food, I wouldn't throw all any of the um, peelings or anything like that away. I would take them to the garden, and I threw them under a bush, because I thought, well, at least they go back to Mother Earth, and they're not going to end up in the waste site, in the landfill. And at the end of the week, I was really proud, because we've made just, like, that much trash, like, of, in a whole week. So... This was becoming like, I was almost becoming, um, I don't want to use the word fixated, but it was definitely becoming strong in me. And even we went, I remember we went out shopping and I would always have my own bags. And then one lady said to me, yes, you look like the type of person that would carry her own bags around with her, you know, to save on waste. And I thought, oh, you know. <laughs> and, um, but it became so strong that I began thinking, maybe this is something I have to bring to Ananda. Maybe this is like, my dharma or like part of it because it's so strong in me. I remember Devi um, a few weeks before and she was here, she was, no, it was Jyotish, saying, find that thing that resonates with you and that's what you can bring to Ananda. So I thought, this resonates with me. This is, I'm passionate about this. This is what I can bring to Ananda. I will, when I get back, I will organize um, meetings, maybe like once a month, once a week, in which we can all come together and we can talk about how we can help the environment, social issues, all of these things. And an amazing thing happened. I came back to Ananda. It just disappeared out of my consciousness. It just wasn't there anymore. And it's as if where I was, where I am now at Ananda, and what I was experiencing then, it was kind of like the new me where I am and the old me, what I could have been. Um, and it wasn't on the same level of vibration. It just didn't fit. And it's not so much, the point is not so much about what I would have been doing on an outward level if I wasn't at Ananda, but it started this whole process of thinking, what would my consciousness have been like if I wasn't at Ananda? What would I... Who would I be? Um, you know, I, I would probably have been an activist somewhere, you know, doing fighting for this, that, or the other. But mainly, what would I be? And another interesting experience, which is very linked to this, which showed me how much I have changed since I've been here, um, along the same lines, really. Um, I'm vegan, and I wrote the, um, the cookbook. For those of you who don't know, there's the Ananda Assisi cookbook in um, about, it came out about three years ago, but it's not vegan because at the time of writing it, I wasn't vegan. So it has, according to Yogananda's teachings, it includes dairy products. Um, and it's a beautiful book and it explains at the beginning um, all about Yogananda's teachings on diet. So this book has been out for a few years and um, about a year ago, I started receiving these emails all of a sudden from these vegan activists. And um, they started coming to the front office through Ahimsa, started sending them to me. Uh, first one, and uh, you know, um, heavy, very heavy. And then there was another one, and then another one, and then another one. And Ahimsa said, you know, Mahir, I, I just won't send them to you anymore because, you know, they're really, really, I read them and they're really like strong, negative energy. And um, I said, no, I want to have them all. I want all of them. And I think there were 43 that came in the end. And I felt kind of somewhat about, I thought of Swamiji when he was targeted, you know, by all of these, you know, by his people he thought were his friends, but they were just sending him... Um, they were trying to destroy him, you know, like I'm thinking of SRF mainly and the, the, how difficult that must have been for him. And I thought, gosh, this experience is so tiny compared to his, but it really, it actually hurt me a lot. But I really um, meditated and I wanted to respond to these people. So um, after really going inside and trying to feel what to say, I wrote them back a reply and it really came from my heart. And the, more or less the energy which they wrote with was very, it talked badly of Yogananda, of Ananda, the people at Ananda, how hypocritical they were, and of me personally and of the book. The energy was very negative. It wasn't informed at all. Um, 
most of them hadn't even read the book, they just believed what somebody else had informed them. And, uh, and then hurled all this abuse, personal abuse. And um, so I wrote back and I, I tried to help them to understand that it's not in, you know, I agreed with everything that they said, but what I've learned here, what I saw that I learned is that there's a right moment to say things in the right way and that we can't change other people with violent words or hurling abuse at them, um, all of these contractive ways of trying to change people, but really by, only by love, by patience, tolerance, by understanding. And so I saw the contrast. I agreed with what they said and I could, I could see myself in them. I could see myself as that in another life or if I wasn't on the spiritual path consciously, I could see myself as that vegan activist who was pointing the finger and saying, you're wrong, you know, you, everything that you're doing is wrong, you don't agree with me, you don't understand. And, um, and it made me realize how much, how grateful I am for this spiritual path how far I've come in my um, expansion to my, to my understanding of others, of this world, of this life. And that's really expansion is I think the word that I'd like to, to use today to say what I'm most grateful for about the spiritual path. The expansion that is happening inside of me and each one of us, um, not just being living my life thinking I'm a good person and that I'm doing good things and not expanding, not changing, not growing. Um, I think that all of us get the opportunity every day to expand in every single thing that we do. And sometimes we are ready to rise to the occasion and meet it. Sometimes we, I don't think we even notice that there's an opportunity there for expansion and we allow ourselves to just let that opportunity pass by. But um, sometimes I know Guruji just puts us in very extreme situations where we've really not got any choice but to, um, to learn the lesson, to expand or, or uh, you know, it's just very obvious. So I'd like to just give a few examples of things that have happened to me in which I'm, and, and share with you the ways of which I felt I've expanded. The first was, um, when I went to teach at the school, at the Ananda School, this was, I taught English in the school for two years, and it was quite interesting because there was always one thing I said, if I would refuse to do in life one thing, it would be be a teacher. I had this absolute refusal. I would not be a teacher. It was just, it scared me. It was alien to me. I didn't want to do it. And I still don't know how I ended up in that school. It's, it's just, it's a mystery. But being forced into this situation, I really, I'm so grateful because it helped me in so many ways. The lessons that I felt I learned, apart from learning to love each and every one of those children, like so dearly, they're just, they were all just like you, like I said at the beginning, that each one of you is so special in your own way. The same with those children, just to learn to see the beauty in them. That's the thing that Education for Life teaches, to look at the, the beauty, the positive aspects of each child and to use that to help the, the less strong areas, the weaknesses, to be able to develop. And so I used that in the school environment, but what I learned more importantly was to apply education for life to everything. To see in every adult, you know, every person that I came in interaction with is to concentrate on the positive see the positive, and if you concentrate on the positive, then that will shine, and uh, the weaknesses will then be, will be carried along by that positivity. And I, another important lesson I learned was um, actually self-acceptance, because I have some good qualities for teaching. Um, I have a lot of enthusiasm, dedication, a lot of energy, and I love the kids. But there were some qualities that I was missing, and I was quite, you know, I became quite um, open and honest with myself about that, that I was not like this amazing teacher, um, naturally gifted teacher. And before I wasn't really able to accept so much the, the weaknesses in myself, but through education for life, through that experience, I began to think, okay, the most important thing is that I'm doing my best. 
And I may not be as good as Darshan or as good as Gauri or as good as any, but I'm doing my best and that's all that can be asked. So at the end of every lesson, I knew that I'd given my best and, and that was it. Another experience I had was um, these book presentations. Through the book, I, I had to go around big major cities in Italy and talk um, in front of a public between, well, one time was over 100 people, but then there were also audiences of just 50 or 20. And this was probably the hardest thing that I've ever had to do because one of my blocks is speaking like I am now in front of, um, in front of people. And I resisted, I resisted so much um, these presentations. I remember being on one day on the way up to Milan in the car and I caught myself, I was actually praying to Guruji um, to make something happen so that it would all be canceled so I wouldn't have to go. And I caught myself with that thought, I'm like, hang on a minute, there's something wrong here. I began thinking of Nandini and others who are always with other people, always in the public, and how they just have so much joy doing it. And so I realized that it's not the situ it wasn't the situation that was wrong. That was neutral, as Yogananda says. But it was my attitude, it was something in me that was wrong and that I didn't need to learn to just reluctantly uh, say, okay, if that's what you want me to do, then I'll go and do it, and uh, clench my teeth, and I hope I get it over and done with, and I survive, and I have to learn to embrace these situations and do everything that's asked with joy. So that was the beginning of another great lesson, is just embrace whatever comes and learn to find the joy in it. And then the third example, and the last example I'd like to give is when I had to um, sing in Swami asked me, well, not directly, but anyway, he was giving a um, book presentation on revelations of Christ, and he always asks for music before, and he wanted music from the auditorium. And I would have been, I was singing Mary Mag the song of Mary Magdalene here at Ananda Assisi, and he shortlisted the songs anyway. He had to keep like cutting songs out, and he decided on four songs, and one of them was the song of Mary Magdalene. So. You know, I, I came to find out that I would have to sing in one of the most famous theatres of Italy, a solo in front of 700 people. And that was, quite frankly, incredibly scary. And so, I thought, okay, how am I going to deal with this? How am I get through? Because I, want, I don't want to get on that stage and be really, really terrified. I want to be in Guruji's presence when I do that. So I began an exercise of... I would not let my mind go into fear. Every time a thought tried to come in um, of nerves or fear or anything, I pushed it away and I remained with so much willpower and so much force in the present moment, in the present moment, in the present moment. And I realized that fear only exists outside of the present moment. It's just a projection of our mind. But when we're in the present moment and we're concentrated on, well, God is in the present moment. God is the present moment. So when we're in the present moment, we're in God's presence. So I made it all the way through up until I got up to that stage with the microphone without letting one thought of fear come in because I remained firm and focused in the present moment. And just to conclude everything, I was in meditation a couple of weeks ago and um, I began thinking about something that I know is my dharma that I'm actually quite, you know, scared about. It's not very easy. And I realized um, I was having these fearful thoughts. They just crept in during meditation. And I became aware that Yogananda wasn't present. I wasn't thinking of Yogananda. And so I called on him immediately to come and it was amazing because in front of me was the same scene that I was imagining that was giving me so much fear. And, and Yogananda came in and the fear just vanished and I was looking at exactly the same scene and I was so tranquil, um, so at peace and so detached from such a different attitude to watching the same scene. And immediately the, song, the words of Swamiji's song just came into my mind, I live without fear. Um, Though green summer fades and winter draws near, my Lord, in your presence, I live without fear. And it was the first time that I'd actually really had an experience of these words. I always understood them, of course, from 
you know, the words and on a surface level, the meaning. But then it was so clear that if we can live our life always in God's presence with him present, we can, we can confront anything that comes our way and we can confront it with joy and knowing that it's, it's just important that we're doing our best we're channels, we're doing our 25% just by being willing, joyfully, and doing our best, and the rest is up to him. So, God bless you. So, if I can invite uh, those speakers to come up, we'll just send them three ohms. And then also, um, after that, I'm going to have Narya, if you want to come up and just reflect or say a few words. You could even speak in Italian. But uh, why don't we just uh, take a moment to bless these speakers and bless what they just gave us, the inspiration they shared. È difficile parlare dopo aver sentito queste belle esperienze che ognuno di voi ha portato qui, perché sono esperienze che arrivano dal cuore, sono esperienze che hanno un profondo significato nella vostra vita. E quando le trasmettete, parlate con la bocca, ma le vibrazioni escono dal cuore e veramente ci toccano tutti. Non è, non è sempre facilissimo parlare in pubblico. Vi voglio raccontare come è successo a me. Perché io, a dire la verità, ero molto timido. Timidissimo. Non ho mai avuto neanche l'idea di parlare in pubblico, perché solo l'idea di parlare mi spaventava. E quando sono ritornato dall'America, eh, Swami, eravamo il primo Mahasa Madi ad Assisi, ed era stato un grandissimo successo. Tantissime persone. E, e lui dieci minuti prima del suo intervento di Swami, si gira e mi dice Paolo, vuoi presentarmi tu? Ci saranno state 500 persone. Il mio cuore ha cominciato a battere, bom 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 bom, qui, qui, sulla testa. <ride> e ho detto, muoio. Adesso faccio un infarto e muoio. E più pensavo ad andare su dal palco, più il cuore aumentava i battiti, sembrava un trattore, tutto che tremava. Hanno finito il coro e Swami mi guarda e mi fa, non capivo più niente, ero in totale tilt mentale, le parole che <ride> sono uscite erano come un balbuziente e ho detto una cosa che non andava bene. E suo amico era davanti che mi guardava e ho detto vi voglio introdurre suo amico che con molta sofferenza <ride> che con molta sofferenza e molta fatica ha creato questa comunità. Come, <ride> Come suo amico ha sentito queste cose? È venuto in piedi <ride> è salita sul palco mi ha preso per mano e mi ha detto al pubblico l'ha detto ma l'ha detto a me con molta gioia e con molta forza 
attraverso l'energia di Yogananda ho potuto creare questa bellissima famiglia e non ho detto più niente <ride> io sono andato giù e lui ha continuato a parlare io credevo che era l'ultima volta che suono mi parlava <ride> davanti a 500 persone dire una cosa sbagliata non sbagliata non capivo più niente ero completamente in, fuori fuori giri, no, no. il cuore era talmente agitato e capisco quando uno dice che parlare in pubblico l'emozione è così forte che equivale quasi alla morte. E, ed, è, ed è vero, perché quando si parla con tutta questa energia, soprattutto ad Ananda e con Suomi davanti, rischi di dire delle cose che non pensi, perché arrivano tante informazioni un po' dappertutto e ti mandano in crisi. Finita l'introduzione, la presentazione di Swami, dice andiamo su in camera. Lui stava all'ultimo piano del Grand Hotel Assisi, mi prende per mano e mi dice è andata benissimo, non ti preoccupare. E da quel giorno mi ha sempre messo in prima fila durante tutte le volte che lui ha presentato. E lì ho capito l'importanza di essere uno che parla a una persona. Il pubblico è una persona con tante emozioni, con, tante, diciamo, punti, con tanti punti di vista e tu ti devi sintonizzare con quella persona. Questo era il mio punto e da quel giorno tutto è andato bene. Non benissimo perché molte volte mi emozionavo, parlare davanti ai grandi pubblici non è sempre facile, soprattutto se ci sono telecamere, se ci sono luci, se ci sono ospiti che non sono di Ananda perché l'energia è un po' diversa, però è vero, noi siamo tutti chiamati a parlare, a dare. I maestri e Yogananda hanno detto arriverà un giorno dove... Ci sarà così bisogno di questi insegnamenti che tutti dovranno scendere in campo perché non ci saranno sufficienti insegnanti. E ognuno di voi, anche se siete giovani, se non avete coraggio, se non avete, diciamo, mai provato prima, siete chiamati dal Maestro per poter dare quello che avete sperimentato. Ed è molto, anche se siete qua da un anno, da un mese, ma soltanto il desiderio di poter entrare in sintonia con questi insegnamenti e con i nostri maestri è tantissimo. Questo che percepite, datelo, senza aver paura di dare qualcosa di più che magari le persone non capiscono, non ha importanza. Quello che capiscono sempre non è quello che dite, perché magari dopo dieci minuti non se lo ricordano più. Quello che arriva è il magnetismo che esce dal cuore. E quello arriva sempre. E rimane. Quel seme che mettete dentro ad una persona, quando voi parlate, quando avete parlato oggi, quando parlate anche qui con gli ospiti, quel magnetismo entra dentro le persone ed è un seme di Dio. E rimane. E piano piano le persone, quando dicono al proprio ragazzo ti voglio bene, mettono una goccina d'acqua su quel seme e poi un giorno vogliono un bene molto più grande e arriveranno ad Ananda o troveranno la loro strada, che non è sempre detto che sia di Ananda, ma una strada bella che produrrà tanti bei frutti perché potranno mettersi in sintonia con la loro parte più alta e con Dio. Per cui è stata una grande gioia essere qua ad ascoltare queste cose che vengono fuori spontanee e che sono bellissime. Rimanete così, non studiate tanto nei libri, date quello che sentite. E quello che avete capito nei libri trasformatelo nel vostro modo perché ognuno di noi è unico. E Dio non vuole che uno copia Anand, Kirtani, Naria o altri, non ha importanza. Date quello che siete, perché quello è il vostro seme che Dio ha fatto per voi per darlo ad un altro. Grazie.